Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, bon dia. <laughs> um, so, uh, algorithms and data structures. Yeah, I took a, a course uh, at university that had this title. Yeah, it, it sounded boring then too. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna start off, um, I, first off, with a big uh, thank you. This isn't on. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me here. Uh, it's such an honor to kick off uh, what's so far been a fabulous conference uh, on a beach in Brazil. Awesome idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I'm not Nell. You may or may not have noticed that the, uh, the picture of the, the one female speaker on the list uh, changed uh, about midway through. So uh, Nell uh, came to me and we've been talking about this conference. Uh, my comp company was sponsoring her coming uh, and she, she couldn't make it. And so I was like, oh, a, a conference on a beach in Brazil. You, you know, I'll sub for you. <laughs> it was a really tough decision. But uh, the other thing uh, I agreed to with Nell was I would give her talk. <laughs> so she was doing a talk on algorithms. I was like, yeah, all right, I can talk on algorithms. Yeah, there's, it's a beach. We're on a beach. Woohoo! So uh, this is what she told me. She said, yeah, talk about algorithms and Ruby, how they affect your app. That was pretty much how she sold, sold it. Uh, maybe some other ideas. So I was like, all right, I'll make something up about algorithms. It'll be fun. We're on a beach. You know, cool. Uh, so algorithms in Ruby. And yeah, so speaking in a, a foreign country where non-native English speakers said, don't ever play, have a joke. That's a play on words. They don't translate. Did it anyway. So yeah, I'm going to talk about, you know, rhythms, like cool Brazilian music. Yeah, no, I'm not. <laughs> All right, seriously, what am I going to talk about? So first, I want to talk, uh, tell you a story uh, about how this talk came to be, uh, why Nell picked uh, a talk about algorithms, uh, and why I thought that was a, a cool thing to talk about. So I have a degree in computer science. Uh, and this story starts out, actually, I know Nell from university. We met years and years ago. Um, more years now than I'd like to admit. <laughs> we were both at university, and she was studying theater, and I was studying computer science. Uh, and so we've uh, grown and uh, both worked in, in lots of different industries, uh, and now we, we work in the same industry. We're both Ruby programmers. Um, and so Nell and I have a lot of conversations about uh, different, different backgrounds in our community uh, and how we all get to be in this room, right? What do we do? Well, we're all Ruby programmers, or you know, I heard some, some Python folks too, right? But programmers, we all think about, about algorithms. Uh, we've probably all faced the, the dreaded tech interview. Uh, and so Nell uh, was, we were talking about these tech interviews and being prepared, and she felt that she was missing something by not having a degree in computer science. Uh, what, you know, what does that give you in this kind of dreaded uh, tech interview where you have to know about, about algorithms? So it, that's a little strange to me. Like, when did, when did algorithms become scary? Uh, is this, has this become a dirty word? Uh, so is it this, is the same word in Portuguese, algorithm? Is it? Okay, I thought it might be. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so I'll start off with a definition, a standard. All right, so an algorithm, step-by-step -step process. It's, it's an implementation, right? It's how we, how we actually write our code to solve a problem, that actual implementation. That's what we're talking about. Uh, there's lots of types of algorithms, uh, and I think this is definitely what I learned about in university for computer science, the different types of algorithms, greedy, deterministic, big, funky uh, flash words, <laughs> buzzwords. Um, and this isn't really what I think about when I think of algorithms. I think about what I do every day, which is problem solving. There's some business problem, uh, maybe technical problem, uh, something with people. I always, I always say my job's about people, uh, us using technology to solve problems. Uh, and that's a really cool idea. When I think of algorithms, so I'm going to point out, I say, you know, every line of code we write, we're writing uh, a, new, a, a new algorithm, right? We're inventing algorithms all the time to solve problems. This is really cool. I think, I hear the word algorithm, I think that's fun. 
fun. This is how we solve problems. This isn't a scary word. So uh, it's a broad topic of algorithms. Uh, and it's, it's interesting that it's become kind of a scary word. We think of tech interviews and, oh, I need to know about, uh, right, that slide back there. I need to know all of this stuff <laughs> going into algorithm. I have to remember uh, what I learned about in university, how to implement things in different ways, about the, the pros and cons of all of this stuff. And really, what I think about uh, in algorithms, right, solving problems. So I'm going to talk about how how we solve problems in Ruby and some of the uh, kind of interesting uh, questions that are in the broad topic uh, of algorithms, how they apply to Ruby. Uh, and in particular, I was thinking about, as I give this talk again, that, that difference between what did I learn as a, a CS major in university uh, versus someone who's come to this industry as a second career uh, or with different uh, academic or formal training. Uh, and I realized there's a bit, there's a bit of a contradiction uh, in what I do today, how I implement algorithms, uh, and what I learned about in school. It's, it's very different to me. And that's a question uh, that I wanted to investigate. I thought, well, why not? Let's investigate that, talk, uh, that question with this talk. So my question that I thought was interesting uh, is about a difference between clean, object-oriented um, code uh, and performant code. Is, the, is there an issue there? I think about uh, the code I write every day, lots of objects, lots of function calls, uh, and the code I was taught to write in school, where we were looking to optimize things mainly for speed. Um, and what, you know, our, our pattern of thinking then and my pattern of thinking now. Um, and so I was thinking about this question, I realized I wanted to answer it with this talk, and I was really lucky because uh, this past Tuesday, the, the last Tuesday in Seattle, time zones are hard, <laughs> uh, but the last Tuesday that happened in Seattle, uh, Uncle Bob, uh, Robert C. Martin, who wrote Clean Code, came and gave a talk. It was very brief, he was there just in, in the evening on Tuesday, and I got to go see him. Uh, and if you haven't read the, the book Clean Code, I really suggest, uh, suggest you you read it, it's great for professional programmers. He talks about um, these uh, solid principles, principles of simple design, object-oriented um, design patterns, things like that. So it was a really uh, an interesting thing happened to this talk. So he was going on uh, on these things he usually talks about, principles, having uh, short, uh, short readable uh, methods, replacing a lot of um, procedural code with uh, some objects or more function calls, making it easy to read. And he made a comment that was, um, we, we, we have a, a limited stack. Uh, and it's interesting because he was talking about us as people, the stack in our, our head of what we can comprehend at once, what we can process. And uh, it, the, the talk moved on after he made that comment. And there was a question at the end that, I really wish he had answered, <laughs> which uh, a gentleman in the audience um, mis misheard uh, about the limited stack and said, Bob, you know, there's a bit of a contradiction there. You talk about a limited stack, but then you go on and say, you know, replace these procedural code with all these function calls. Uh, isn't all of these functions that were put in objects that we're putting onto the stack, you know, making our, our stack much bigger, we need uh, much more processing time to deal with this, uh, isn't that uh, a contradiction where you say a limited stack? And uh, Bob didn't actually answer that question. He just remembered that he referred to the stack as our stack and the limited amount of information we could process and said, well, no, it's, it's much simpler for us to process something that's very readable when you replace like a bunch of if-else statements with function calls that are well named. You can get a gist of what's going on without reading through 150 lines of code. Uh, so that was his answer. But I was really hoping he would answer the question that was asked of, you know, aren't, isn't there a, a performance hit um, when we do this, when we replace the, the procedural code, uh, the, the code that, frankly, I learned about uh, in, in university and we think about. So 
All right, there's, there's the talk. There's a, there's a bit of a, a thesis here. Um, I write a lot of algorithms. Uh, I follow, uh, I try my best uh, to write tests and refactor what I see as procedural code into more object-oriented code. Uh, lots of function calls, more objects. Um, and so I, as a Rubyist, this is how we think about uh, using Ruby. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll get to it a little, uh, a little further down, but you know, thinking about this uh, idea, do we have to worry about kind of creating all of these objects uh, in Ruby? Is there, is there an issue there? All right, uh, so I set out uh, with the intention of looking at some code uh, to refactor. Um, so I, I teach a number of Ruby classes, and one of the problems that I give my students, uh, which they hate me for, because <laughs> uh, it's usually a hard, a hard problem for intro, uh, intro students, but it's a really good one, is to write a tic-tac-toe pro prob program. Uh, so implement tic-tac-toe. I give them a test framework. They need to make the test pass. And to make the test pass, they have to implement tic-tac-toe. So a simple little uh, kids game. I've been looking at this for a number of years now. And I get some really interesting approaches to this problem. Some of them are beautiful objects interacting with each other uh, to come together and solve this problem. Some of them are a giant case statement in a wall loop of just <laughs> what you imagine as the craziest procedural code, but it makes the test pass. So it's uh, that algorithm there, right? The implementation. Uh, there's so many different ways to solve this problem. So I was thinking about this, and I was going through and grabbing the code and going to performance test it with different implementations. And I realized, you know, I'm, uh, I'm here at a conference dedicated to Jim and in the open source community. So I'm going to go out there and, and grab some code. And I'm going to grab some, some code that other people have done that I'm, uh, if you've followed the uh, solid movements, uh, the object-oriented uh, programming in Ruby, Ruby um, this idea of what clean code means to our community, uh, you've probably encountered uh, these two people and uh, possibly these katas. So uh, I'm not going to go into the, the problems uh, that are there, but it's really simple. The Gilded Rose kata um, is an interesting problem. It's about uh, changing prices for tickets. It, it honestly doesn't make a lot of sense, but it has some interesting code. You can do it very procedurally, uh, or you can do it in a very object-oriented fashion. Uh, and that's, that's true of uh, almost every problem that we encounter in computer science. So a couple of katas that I want to look at. Um, and I specifically picked these because there's, uh, there's code out there uh, that you can find on GitHub uh, to play with. Lots of people have approached these problems. You can see different solutions. Uh, and I threw FizzBuzz in there because Jim had a really interesting uh, implementation in Ruby that was Lambda, cal uh, Lambda Calculus uh, implementation in Ruby. And I just really, really wanted to performance test that because I was very curious. All right. So I set out with a hypothesis that, all right, we're in the Ruby community. We say we should have clean, object-oriented code. So there shouldn't be a statistical difference uh, in the runtime between our clean code uh, and what I like to refer to as if-else death <laughs> code. Big, long procedures, lots of if-else, uh, throw in some case statements, whatever kind of procedural code you can imagine. All right, so you know, thinking about this, big movement, this is how we write code, we shouldn't be taking in a performance hit uh, when we do this. All right, since I cut out most of my code from these slides, I have to have one slide that has some code in it. So there it is. This was the timer class I used. Uh, it uh, works across, it's very simple, uh, works across many implementations of Ruby, uh, as long as they implement blocks. Uh, and just a simple way of getting the time of how long something ran uh, and a way of specifying how many times I want to test it. So the average runtime uh, of some code. All right. Uh, and then I looked at some implementations. So I looked at JRuby, uh, Rubinius, uh, 187. I used Ruby Enterprise Edition. Um, it was easier to get working with the newer syntax. Um, 193, 20, and 21. So, uh, got some MRI, bunch of YARV, JVM, and Rubinius. <laughs> so what did I find? I collected uh, my results here, put them up. So this was the beer song kata 
Uh, so if you've uh, ever uh, encountered a repetitive, sing-songy kids nursery rhyme, we have one of these in English. That's the 99 bottles of beer on the wall. Uh, and that's the idea. Write a program that will sing or generate the lyrics for 99 bottles of beer on the wall. So uh, my labeling here is the beer song, uh, If Else Death, IED. Uh, the beer song as object oriented, that's Jim's implementation uh, that has, um, he's a little more tolerant in his code of having conditionals. Uh, it's some objects, function calls, some conditionals in there. And then what I like to call the object oriented extreme version, uh, which is Sandy Metz's implementation of this. Uh, and this isn't exactly fair because her implementation uh, supports many different uh, nursery rhymes or these repetitive songs. Um, so it does more than simply solve the kata. It's more extensible. So you can point that out. It's a little unfair. But these are the results. Uh, so there's time differences between these implementations. The procedural one is by far the fastest. Uh, and then I said I tested on JRuby, um, <laughs> yay Java. Um, it was so far off in the, the time, I skewed the graph too much, you couldn't actually see the differences here, so I just cut Java from the graph. It's the same pattern, uh, the procedural one's the fastest, the extreme uh, object-oriented case where it's this awesome collection of objects coming together to solve a problem, uh, by far the slowest. So same pattern, uh, and you can see uh, some interesting things here, um, you know, some, some jump with, uh, with YARV implementations from MRI. So, some cool stuff going on there. Uh, this is the Gilded Rose kata. So, uh, there's no, uh, I actually don't have the code uh, for the extreme object-oriented, um, ex extreme object-oriented case. So, this is just the procedural versus a bunch of objects. Um, much faster for the procedural in this case. One, one method with a bunch of if-else if clauses. Okay, uh, and then something I found, uh, so FizzBuzz followed the same pattern uh, for the, um, uh, the if-else death and the object-oriented case uh, across languages, but the FizzBuzz Lambda implementation that Jim Wyrick did um, had this results. Uh, so JRuby uh, was by far the fastest. Yay, just in time compilation. If you call tons and tons of methods in JRuby, uh, it starts to do some look ahead and optimization that we don't have uh, in Ruby. Uh, Rubinius does some also optimization, um, and uh, Yarv doesn't seem to be doing the same implementation. There's a, a huge difference. Those are seconds on there. So that's uh, somewhere, it was always somewhere between like 38 and 49 seconds. Uh, and JRuby was somewhere around seven seconds. So huge difference there. It's an interesting result. All right, so is it statistically, statistically significant? Yes, yeah, there's definitely a runtime difference uh, in the significance of these things, which is what I would expect coming out of, of university, but not necessarily as someone who just came into the Ruby community uh, and we hear about how you should write code. Um, I think having gone through that traditional route uh, into a computer science position where I write algorithms every day, uh, I may be a little more uh, tolerant of uh, if else death, so to speak, uh, or procedural code, because uh, it's kind of what I grew up with, okay? Uh, but how much should we really care on this in Ruby? You know, am I up here saying you should go refactor back to the fast if else death? No, no, I'm really not saying that. Uh, if we go back and look at these, these results, you know, we're still looking at fractions of a second in runtime for these things. You know, if you're doing anything in your application of significance, going into a database, uh, calling over a network to an API, uh, responding to users on, a, on an app, uh, it's gonna be, you know, these seconds that it takes to do the calculation uh, are not going to impact the runtime uh, of your, your app uh, really significantly. So I'm not saying to go back, but uh, I wanted to investigate this uh, and kind of start a discussion. Uh, I think it's something that we maybe lose sight of. Um, and I talked about some 
I was going to talk a little bit. I said the algorithms and data structures, right? What are data structures? There's some stuff built into Ruby that we use all the time uh, without necessarily thinking uh, about kind of uh, our big O, the, the traditional sense, right? How many operations? Uh, are we incurring by using some of the built-in mechanisms instead of reinventing the wheel? Well, we're, we're in open source, we've used lots of Ruby gems, we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. We should use what's built in and given. Uh, but it's, it's nice to think about um, maybe some of the performance hits that we're taking, you know, searching and sorting. If we're using things in the enumerable class uh, in Ruby, they're all based off of each. They have to be doing at least one method call to each. Uh, and there's, there's while loops, we could use them, but we tend not to. Uh, it's just, it's something to think about uh, in our choice. Um, data structures in Ruby, how they're actually implemented and translating to C code. Uh, I'm gonna kind of gloss over that, but if you wanna ask me a question about it, I'll, I'd be happy to answer more about that. So just thinking about the data structures that we're using, how they're implemented, and how many uh, operations we're really doing. All right, so, Here's some other things I got out of my computer science education. It was more about the philosophy of computer programming um, at the core. And uh, I was given when I graduated, um, part of like the computer science uh, seniors that year, we all got a copy of Donald Knuth's The Art of Computer Programming. A really a good book goes into a lot of the um, kind of history of where we've come from in computing and thinking about uh, how to write our code. And he talks about, almost right in the beginning of the book, uh, the aesthetics of our code. How do we define aesthetics? Uh, and there's, there's so many different ways to think about aesthetics of code. Uh, I think we tend to jump to the maintainability, extensibility, um, back where I was saying, you know, that extreme object-oriented version of the beer song. You could implement other songs with that. Uh, so, of course, it's going to run a little slower. It's doing more things, it's capable of doing more things. So what are our aesthetics? What do we think about when we implement uh, our, our algorithms? Um, and uh, a quote down there from uh, Gregory uh, Chaitin, um, I'll show you can't prove that a program is elegant. Basically talking about uh, something referred to as the, the halting problem or the Godel's uh, incompleteness problem, uh, where uh, basically uh, you can't guarantee um, or you can't, you can't prove that an implementation, an algorithm, uh, will, be, um, uh, will work for every possible input. You can't prove it. So we think about these things. Uh, to define our aesthetics. As like I said, in our community, we think more about maintainability than necessarily time. Um, we think small. What does simple really mean, right? How do you really define these uh, for an algorithm? So I ask you to, to question uh, when you implement an algorithm, is there another way to do this? And it's a fun question to ask because you can think about, think about how could I change this? Uh, is there a better way for what I'm doing? Fun things to think about, and in general, going back and reapproaching a problem, re-implementing an algorithm, I think gives you that, that really fun sense of problem solving. So let's, let's go back and redefine uh, what algorithm means in our community. Let's not make it a dirty word, and think about it as fun problem solvings and different ways to do this, exploring, seeing what Ruby gives us. All right, all of my talks, I always end with some kind of reading list. Uh, so some, some suggestions here, some very uh, practical things on these, on these topics. If you haven't read Ruby under a microscope and you're a Ruby programmer, uh, great insight into uh, how, the, um, how it's implemented as a language. Uh, it also talks a little bit about JRuby and Rubinius. Um, Clean Code by Uncle Bob, as I mentioned. Uh, practical Object Oriented Design by Sandy. Uh, and then some less practical ones like The Art of Computer Programming uh, and Godel Escher Bach, more about the kind of cerebral things we think about in computer science. All right, so who I really am. Uh, I'm Renee Hendrickson. I work uh, in Seattle, Washington in the United States. Uh, for a company called NERD, Northwest Independent Ruby Development. Uh, we do uh, Ruby on Rails applications and training. Uh, and I have a degree in computer science, as I might have mentioned that. Are there any questions? I'm pretty close on time, but I, th I think I've got six minutes, according to this. 
Awesome, she agrees. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take it. I assume there's translation from Portuguese? Yes, awesome. Uh, so, Tim, yes. <laughs> Microphone? I knew Tim would ask a question on this. Hi, Rene. Thanks for your talk. It was awesome. Uh, I was just um, actually uh, interested in the question of why you think Java was so far off the charts. Did you take any of the, the startup times for the JVM into account? Was that something that might have been playing a role? Uh, yeah, a bit of the, uh, the startup time. Um, by the time my timer got there, it should have already been started up. Uh, so the startup time wasn't taken into account with those numbers that I was showing. However, the just-in-time compiler, uh, it was not being hit. I didn't have enough operations to actually, uh, until the Lambda calculus one, there was enough operations that it started to get the, the JIT uh, on, and that's why it, it speeded up. So you can definitely see a huge improvement uh, on bigger applications that are doing a lot of, of the same computation over and over with JRuby. Um, so it can, it can definitely speed up your program. Uh, in this case, for just the small, I'm going to run this algorithm uh, on the computer, you're sitting there and waiting. So. And, and as a follow-up, would any of these algorithms you tried have profited from any sort of concurrency? that you would have split it out over, over several processors? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, I actually didn't keep the slide in there, but I was going to talk about uh, threading and how Ruby handles threads versus Rubinius and versus JRuby, because there's definitely uh, some processing that you could do uh, concurrently in different threads uh, that would probably speed this up. Um, and especially if you're using an implementation that takes an advantage of multiple cores uh, on your machine, um, which Standard MRI or YARV don't tend to do. You need to move on to Rubinius or JRuby if you want to take advantage of multiple cores. So yeah, that was uh, basically for time, I cut it out. But thank you for asking that. Thank you. Any other questions? Is that a hand up anywhere? No? Okay, so I'm actually going to say something about my thank you slide, because I always say so long and thanks for all the fish, uh, but I actually went out on the raft boat yesterday and swam with a whole bunch of Brazilian fish, so really, thank you for the fish, that was so cool. 